Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, also, I want to say uh, thanks for having me. The, uh, you know, this is a, a research organization unlike any other I've experienced before. Um, from the scope of the questions that you guys are trying to address to your, your approach you're taking to solve the problem, and really also at the level of the teamwork um, that you can clearly see is in place is um, something I've never experienced before, and I just want to say it's a, been a privilege to experience this and um, see what you guys are working on. So thanks uh, for giving me this opportunity. Um, let's see. So uh, before I begin talking about my uh, current work, I just want to talk a little bit about my background to give you a sense of what I'm interested in and um, uh, the sort of my approach to problems. Uh, when I started my research career as a developmental uh, cell biologist interested in the question of how songbirds learn to sing. Uh, and sorry, just heading back. So uh, at this time, when I started grad school, there had been excellent characterization of the neural circuits involved in uh, generating the complex learned behavior that is the song. Uh, there had also been really detailed uh, characterization of the physiology of these circuits, but what was completely lacking was any tools for uh, the generation of uh, genetically modified birds, transgenic birds that you might want to use to study the developmental process. Uh, and now, this was not a problem unique to songbirds, it's a problem uh, general across avian species. The techniques that have been developed for the production of Mammalian transgenics could not be effectively used in birds because of differences in the reproductive biology of birds, in particular the egg-laying behavior. So one of the projects uh, uh, that I started in graduate school was to produce uh, transgenic songbirds using lentiviral vector approach. Here, shown here is a lentivirus. We would uh, culture these, uh, purify them, and inject them into the blasted disk of newly laid finch eggs. Now the goal here is to get the lentivirus to infect the primordial germ cells. These are the cells that will become the sperm and the egg in the mature organism. And uh, once the lentivirus is infected, it integrates its genome into the host genome, uh, taking along with it your gene of interest. And bingo, you get germline transmission shown here. Um, what we demonstrated is that this is effective technique both for the generation of uh, transgenic songbirds and also other avian species we showed it in quails. And this really kicked off, uh, th this technique of lentiviral transgenesis really kicked off a wave of innovation in avian genetics uh, focused on primarily on two applications. One is the generation of poultry that are immune to uh, certain forms of disease like H1N1. And the second is the development of uh, hens that will lay biopharmaceuticals in their eggs. And actually last year, oops. Last year, the uh, FDA approved a um, strain of transgenic chickens that lay uh, in, that produce in their egg whites uh, a human therapeutic protein that can be used pharmaceutically. Now, I mention this um, because I think it's a, a not an unusual story of how technological development in basic research can propagate across fields and end up in unexpected and interesting places. Uh, and with that, I'd like to transition to my um, current work on generating new tools for in vivo imaging in uh, awake behaving rats. Now, the scientific question we're focused on, so we start off with uh, our question and then develop techniques uh, that will help us address that, is this problem of integration in the nervous system. So what do I mean by integration? Well, uh, that can be illustrated with an experiment by Sir, Sir Charles Sherrington at the turn of the last century. Um, and the experiment is as follows, you take a dog, and if you stimulate the shoulder blade of the dog, you elicit a scratch reflex. The dog will use its hind limb to scratch its shoulder. Uh, in this case, you can use a variety of stimuli. Charles Sherrington used a small electrical pulse. And what he found was that as you turn down the current on the electrical pulse, the animal will continue to scratch until you hit a threshold. At that threshold, if you dial the current below that, the animal will no longer scratch. However, if you take two pulses, and present them both, uh, both of which are below the threshold, and present them in succession, so one pulse, a pause, and a second pulse, the animal, the nervous system will sum up those pulses and produce the scratch reflex, okay? So Sherrington went on to demonstrate two things. One, that this integration, that this summation process happened over the time course of seconds, 
and second, that it required the spinal cord, it did not require the, uh, the brain. Uh, now, people have studied this problem of integration in a variety of circuits over the last um, hundred years, and we were interested in um, how organisms use, or how uh, uh, mammals use um, integration in a decision-making process, okay? So a decision-making process uh, that involves integration can be uh, demonstrated here. So we train rats in an operant training chamber to poke their nose into a center poke. At that point, at that point, they receive a series of auditory clicks, okay? So we replace the electrical stimulation now with sensory stimuli, acoustic clicks. A series of clicks, randomly numbered and randomly timed, are presented to the left and the right uh, uh, ears. The animal is trained to count the number of clicks on each side and then orient to the side that had the greater number of clicks. Now, rats can do this quite well. Oops. Rats can do this quite well. Here I'm showing the psychometric performance of 19 rats trained on this task. On the y-axis, you can see the uh, percent of trials, the probability that the uh, animal went to the right side. Um, and you can see that on trials in which there's a greater number of flashes on the right, the animal orients to the right. And on trials in which there's a greater number of flashes to the left, the animal orients to the left. This, the x-axis is the difference between the right and left flashes. Now, unlike Sherrington's experiment, this task requires the uh, cerebral cortex. In particular, it requires a region of the uh, frontal uh, cortex that we call the frontal orienting field. This brain region is uh, part of the motor cortex. It's a multimodal uh, region involved in head, head movements, oral facial movements, and whisker movements. And if you inactivate this region, either using pharmacological techniques like injection of mucimol that I'm showing here, or optogenetic techniques, you reduce the animal's ability to integrate those acoustic clicks. In control trials in, uh, in, in black, you can see a nice steep psychometric function indicating that the animal is very sensitive to the number of clicks. If you infuse mucimol, that psychometric function flattens out, indicating that the animal is less sensitive to the number of clicks. Now, if you record in this region, FOF, you can see that neurons are tuned to uh, the number of uh, clicks on one side. So here you can see the average neuron activity, th sorry, the average activity across a population of neurons. In green, it's average across trials in which there was a greater number of clicks to the preferred side. So each neuron has a side that it prefers clicks on, either the left or the right. So on Trials in which the more stimuli were presented to the preferred side, this neuron ramps up more quickly. On trials in which uh, the, uh, the clicks were presented on the, more clicks were presented on the non-preferred side, it stays flat. And so the activity of these neurons represent in a graded fashion the difference in the number of clicks on either side. So now we're left with a pretty interesting scenario. We know that neural activity, electrical activity in FOF is necessary for integration. And we also know that neurons in FOF across the population are tracking the, uh, are, are integrating these clicks in some way. And the real question we want to address today is, what is the mechanism? How exactly are they doing this? And somehow the nervous system has a way of propagating early sensory information into the future and combining it with new sensory information to make a decision. So the, I would say the leading uh, model of this uh, type of inter integration is uh, a leading network model. It's called the attractor-based network, or simple attractor, or here I'm calling it the homogeneous attractor. And one of the most striking examples of this in the natural world is in the, uh, is in the hindbrain of goldfish. So goldfish have a, a ocular motor integrator that receives a, a velocity input from the motor system. And their job is to turn that velocity input into positional, a memory of the position of the eye. And that can be seen here. So you see this is a single neuron. And every time the eye moves, it's the top trace, every time the eye moves, that neuron bumps up to a new level of activity and holds. As the eye moves again, it bumps up to a new level, and so on and so forth. So that single neuron is representing the position of the eye by integrating uh, velocity information. 
Now, this is not uh, strictly a process that's thought to be occur in the goldfish ocular motor system. It's also been proposed by Mike Shadlin and others as a means of uh, main, uh, integration of evidence in the primate cerebral cortex, okay? So this is, this is thought to be a general solution to the problem. So my interest was in uh, testing this hypothesis, and we could test it by recording populations of neurons in the FOF while the animal performs this integration task. And here, what we want to do is we want to combine two existing technologies to do this. Uh, one is the large-scale population recordings that are achievable using uh, uh, in vivo calcium imaging that were mentioned earlier today and I think will be talked about at length uh, this afternoon. And at the same time, we want to combine that with uh, our method for uh, automated high-throughput training. This is sort of our the, um, engine in, the la in, the, at, in Carlos Brody's lab. It, uh, is the, are the way we train large numbers of animals reliably to generate the large data sets that we can then use statistical analysis on. Now, there's an engineering challenge here, which is that to achieve these large-scale population recordings, you really need to uh, use ta large tabletop microscopes, and therefore you need to somehow fix the animal to the microscope, okay? So that's typically achieved with forced head restraint. You sort of bolt the animal to the microscope. In our case, we were worried that this forced head restraint would decrease performance on the task and would also uh, be difficult to implement in our high-throughput automated facility in which rats are trained essentially by a computer. So we thought, well, okay, what's the solution to this problem? Well, one possibility is we could use the high throughput training facility to teach rats to submit voluntarily to periods of restraint and image during those periods. So this, this is what the solution that we came up with looks like. We implant a titanium head plate in the head of the animal. We teach them to slide their head and head plate into a slot in one wall of the behavioral training chamber, at which point pistons uh, actually clamp the head in place. And actually, this is not a, your standard head plate. It's actually a miniaturized kinematic mount. Um, on the base of the head plate, you see these two features, a conical depression and a groove. And uh, the, the, the clamping mechanism drives two stainless steel ball bearings into the uh, bottom of the head plate, and that does two things. First, it stabilizes the movements of the head to within a few microns so that you can uh, image using two photon microscopy. And second, it registers the head to the exact same position on each insertion. And I'll show a movie of what that looks like here. So on the left, you see uh, this is one of our earliest experiments doing uh, per, uh, of a rat performing voluntary head restraint. On the right, you see the rat um, who's just been trained to insert his head um, and wait in the uh, voluntary head restraint apparatus. And on the left, um, you can see this is a field of GCAMP3 labeled neurons, so the signal to noise is not very high. But the key thing that you can see and what I want you to pay attention to is the registration accuracy and the low amount of brain motion here. So, this movie has not been motion corrected. Any uh, movement that you see here is due to uh, the uh, movement of the animal. And what you can see is that it's extremely reliable. Every time the rat is inserting, it goes exactly to the same place within a few microns, and there's very low brain motion. So uh, next we wanted to know, well, well so, so this, should this should not only provide us with a platform to look at neural dynamics related to integration, but it could also be used in the future for a number of other experiments in the laboratory. But right now, uh, we needed to do a test to see if we could actually get, um, you know, let's address the question at hand, which is the integration of uh, sensory information. So we developed a version of the integration task that can be performed in voluntary head restraint. We've now switched the modality from uh, acoustic clicks to auditory pulses. There are a number of reasons for that. Primarily, we wanted to image not just in FOF, but also in sensory regions 
primary, secondary visual cortex to see how the signal was changing as it was propagating from visual to motor cortices. Uh, here you can see the uh, schematic of the uh, experimental setup. The rat is head fixed under the microscope, and it's got two uh, LEDs that, are, um, that will be flashing. Now, these flashes are brief in time. They're about 10 milliseconds, and the integration period is about a second and a half, and you have up to six flashes on each side. So, so uh, it maintains the same, uh, same features of the original task, which is that you need to integrate over long periods of time. We're going to record in two brain regions, FOF, which I mentioned before, and PPC, which is a brain region that is reciprocally connected with FOF. Um, here you can see examples of neuron dynamics that we've recorded. This is just averaged across trials. And the key feature is that we can uh, recapitulate the same types of dynamics we observed in the clicks, t in the clicks version of the text, and that is that neurons in FOF are encoding the difference between the left and the right flashes across the population. Okay, so how do they do that? Okay, so the, homog uh, the, the, the attractor network or the homogeneous attractor network model uh, proposes the following. There's some input, and then all the neurons will step up and hold after that input. So in order to test this prediction of the model, what we need to do is just look at the responses across the population to these individual sensory pulses. Now there's a slight uh, hiccup here. I told you before that we're, we're in the motor cortex, okay? So there are uh, other signals being processed by the, um, the motor cortex in addition to these flashes. There's um, head movements, there's whisker movements. So we need to decouple or um, decontaminate the response of the neuron to each pulse from these other task relevant parameters that the sensory, that the motor cortex is processing. To do that, we're, we used a linear regression-based approach that's schematized here. Basically, the idea is we model the activity of the neuron at each time point as a combination of its responses to individual flashes and the upcoming choice of the animal. That gives us, the output of that model is a um, prediction of what the neuron response to an individual flash is shown here. We call it the, the visual component of the model. So what does this look like across the uh, cells in FOF and PPC? This is what it looks like. So these are uh, the, the responses to flashes on the preferred side across 53 neurons recorded in uh, FOF and PPC. And as you can see, there's a few different features. First, the cells respond transiently to the stimulus. And second, they all respond at different times, okay? So this, these type of dynamics are totally different than what is uh, predicted by the, uh, the attractor model, the, the original attractor model. And so it's actually, let's see. It's not predicted by the attractor model, but there uh, have been computational models that have predicted that actually another way of representing memories over long time scales is to spread out the information across a population of neurons so that you have a wave of activity propagating through the cortex. And then if you want to know how many flashes there were, you just pay attention to early, late, and uh, medium fi uh, firing neurons, and you can essentially turn the temporal integration problem into a spatial integration problem. And that is our new hypothesis for how FOF um, and possibly other regions of cortex are uh, performing temporal integration of, uh, during decision making. Okay, so that just summarizes uh, the first part of the talk. Um, I showed you that it, temporal integration is a key uh, function of neural systems ranging from uh, simple reflexes in the dog to uh, ocular motor control in the uh, fish, and then ultimately decision making in the cerebral cortex. Showed you that RAT FOF is required for this temporal integration task during decision making. And then finally, in contrast to the sort of leading model of um, integration in the cortex, we found that, the, that heterogeneous dynamics are responsible for encoding of past sensory events. 
So with that, I'd like to transition to a new technology that we've been working on, which is a miniaturized ultra-wide field microscope. Now, I mentioned FOF as being one node involved in the uh, integration of sensory evidence or past sensory events. And really, FOF was found by a combination of scholarship, just reading the literature, and, and frankly, a little bit of luck, right? So you inactivate the brain region, and if it's not involved, you move on to the next one. What we really want to identify more nodes involved in integration or potentially um, brain regions involved in other types of behavior is a systematic mapping of the cortex. And one way to do that, so, so, and that's what this miniature ultra-wide field microscope was designed to do. So what is this? This is a lightweight, implantable, uh, single photon microscope. It offers a seven by seven millimeter field of view. At the perimeter, you have a 20 micron resolution, and at the center, you get um, close to a single micron resolution, roughly less than five. It has a two channel stimulation system, so you can simultaneously record GCAMP and intrinsic uh, signals. It's made from 3D printed uh, material or stock uh, optical um, components. It can be fabricated for less than $1,000. It takes three hours to build. Um, and it's compatible with a wide range of uh, cameras, including the UCLA Miniscope camera. Just to give you a, a sense of sort of the field of view size uh, compared with the size of the rat brain, on the left I have uh, a, a perfused rat brain. On the right, we have the cranial window size that we're typically implanting. And on the far right, uh, you get a sense of the uh, scale of the entire field of view. Now, previously, we had been doing AAV injections to uh, label cortical neurons with um, GCAMP. This is because there were no uh, transgenic rat lines available. So to take full advantage of this microscope, in, in collaboration with Genelia Farms, we've been developing and characterizing new strains of uh, transgenic rats that express GCAMP in cortical neurons and in other brain regions. Here's an example of one of the lines, and you can see uh, widespread uh, GCAMP expression in, uh, throughout the cortex. Um, so what does this microscope look like in practice? Here I'm going to show you uh, on the left uh, two animals in an arena. This one is implanted with a head-mounted microscope. And on the right, I'm going to show you the vasculature so you can get a sense of the stability of the microscope as the animal is moving around and behaving. So as you can see, the microscope is light enough and small enough so that it doesn't disrupt the natural behavior of the animal. Here you can see the animal grooming. Um, as it moves around, walks around the cage, there's essentially no um, movement of the microscope. So again, I've not corrected the, uh, the, the movie on the right, the simultaneously recorded uh, brain. So there's um, basically no brain motion. And uh, I also want to show you the dynamics. So this is a delta F over F of the field of view. Uh, played back at 10x speed. Blue is low activity. Red is high activity. It ranges between 0 and 2 uh, delta F over F. So you can see spatial patterns of activity. You can see waves of activity. Um, and it's very high signal to noise. Interestingly, this, peer, this region that is um, extremely br highly active in the center is the barrel field. And if you uh, zoom in, you can see individual barrels. Now, another interesting feature of these strands of transgenics is not only are they useful for uh, wide field single photon imaging, but you can also, they're also uh, high enough expression so you can zoom in and do uh, cellular resolution two photon imaging. So that's useful because ultimately the this pipeline of these types of experiments is to identify brain regions that are active at specific times during the task, and then to zoom in with our voluntary head restraint system and record at cellular resolution during performance of the task. Uh, 
Um, so uh, with that, I'd just like to summarize what you've seen. We've developed a head-mounted ultra-wide field microscope. In addition to that, we've also generated and characterized strains of transgenic rats that are useful for both wide field and cellular resolution imaging. And then our goal in the future is to uh, combine these two um, techniques to identify other nodes involved in integration during decision making, as well as new tasks that we're pioneering in the laboratory. And with that, I'd like to thank um, my mentors, David Tank and Carlos Brody, as well as collaborators on the variety of experiments that I've just described. So temporal integration task was done in collaboration with Christine Constantinople, a graduate student, uh, sorry, postdoc at Princeton. The transgenic rats were produced at Chenelia Farm um, by Ola Karpova, Kaiyang Guo, and Gowan Tervo. The miniature head-mounted microscope is a collaboration with Stefan Tiberge at Princeton. And finally, the work I described in the beginning on genetic engineering was done at MIT with Carlos Lois, who's now at Caltech, uh, Michael Fee, and collaborators uh, Fernando Notabom and, and Bob Baggett. Um, and with that, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Do we have time for a few questions? question. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, I have a question about um, where you think the circuitry is that's generating the long-lasting integrating responses that you showed in FOF. And in particular, you mentioned multi-area uh, recordings going through the visual system. And I wonder if you could tell us about any clues you're seeing uh, uh, from those as to where the recurrence really is. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. So. I'll, I can, and really, we've only just started to scratch the surface of that, um, and I don't have a great answer. What I can tell you is that the responses in the visual cortex are primarily transient. We, ha we don't have a lot of active neurons in the visual cortex, but they're primarily transient. Um, as you move from the visual cortex to parietal cortex and then frontal cortex, you do see a, a very slight gradient in the time courses, so neurons in you, you have a population of transient cells in the visual cortex. In PPC, the cells get longer time courses, and then in FOF, they get even longer. So um, now that doesn't suggest a, uh, a mechanism, which I think you're after, but it is consistent with other, what other people have found. I'm thinking of Uri Hassan and, and um, others who have seen sort of a, a hierarchy of time courses going from sort of sensory to more higher order areas where, and, and actually this is, you know, this is even better known in the spatial domain, right? So if you look at V1, receptive fields, spatial receptive fields are small. As you move to higher and higher sensory areas, they get larger and larger. So a similar pr thing might be happening in the temporal domain. The mechanism of that is a fantastic question I don't know the answer to. That was a really nice talk. How do you, how much do you think the heterogeneity of the responses you see in FOF is explained by distinct cell types? If you were able to use rats with uh, cell type specific lines, do you think that the heterogeneity could be partially explained? That's an interesting question. Um, I guess when we see the heterogeneity that we observe does not seem to obviously fit into distinct categories um, and seems to be, they, 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 the responses seem to tile the, uh, the, the, the period of integration that we're examining. So it's possible that you have overlapping populations um, but really, I can't say anything. I mean, we'd have, really have to do the experiment. The transgenics that we have don't offer that potential. However, newly developed uh, retrograde targeting of cell types could do that. And it's something we're really excited to try, especially with the wide field microscope, but also with cellular resolution. So I think it's a great experimental question. We just have to do it. Question over here. So the, um, you had this population of neurons that each had these transient responses at yeah. different start times, and yeah. you said they were propagating. Yeah. Is that propagating in a spatially coherent way, like through waves, or do you have a sense of whether it's just like 
random and the quality control on the parts is lousy, which gives a really great distribution. Yeah, we have. Do you no, have a sense that? Uh, like yeah, we have not, we have not seen, this, this does not appear, and we haven't done extensive characterization of this, but this does not appear to be a wave where you get, um, that, that propagates in a sort of a map across the cortex. The neurons that are early and late are intermixed, both in the same field of view and also the same area. So you have early responding neurons in FOF and you have late responding neurons in PPC. So it appears to be intermixed um, with a slight gradient, a slight bias for longer time forces, more anterior. What's causing, what's causing that, the, the difference in onset? Is it neuron type like the person suggested or is it random or like, like a... I, ho or, I, have I have speculation, I have no idea on the mechanism. Um, you know, we're recording in layer two, three. Layer two, three is highly recurrent, right? So, um, and we know that recurrent networks can generate these types of uh, lag dynamics. So if you look at, um, you know, uh, sorry, Konica Rajan has a recent paper where she has modeled um, data I haven't talked about, but in the posterior parietal cortex of mice while they're navigating in a virtual maze, you see neurons that fire in a sequence at different times. Now, what the theoretical work shows is that you can take a randomly, uh, recurrently connected network, and with training, you can train it to fire in a very specific sequence. So it seems like both recurrent networks and also feed-forward networks with delays could both generate this type of response. Um, it's really the most important, I mean, this is the question we really want to know the answer to, but I don't have a good answer yet, sorry. Hi, Ben. Um, do the dynamics of the, of, of Neurons in FOF make predictions about how long uh, a rat could temporally integrate? Uh, are they consistent with the behavioral um, effects that you see? So um, that's an interesting question. The, unfortunately, w what you'd really like to know, so they actually make, they don't make a prediction about how long the time courses. And the reason they don't do that is because we've only imaged in a small window. Remember, these rats are voluntarily hex fixing. There's a, actually a release switch I didn't mention. They can withdraw at any time. So they're really just, we're imaging on the fly. They're sliding in and out. So we don't know how long these signals propagate. They could propagate well past the trial and into the future. They do make an interesting prediction, though, which is that unlike the homogenous network, because these are diverse responses, and presumably you've got some integrator paying attention to neurons that are firing early and late, it, it suggests that this network might be flexible and trainable to not just uh, memorize, not just uh, encode for a specific time course, like throughout the duration, but might be able to be tunable in such a way that you could actually make the memory more leaky. And um, there are uh, people in the laboratory who have been experimenting with integration tasks that actually um, require the animal to, to modulate its amount of, of leakiness. So animals with sort of shorter and shorter term memory because the environment is becoming more and more unstable. So if the vi environment is very stable, you want long memories. But if the environment gets very unstable and you have to you're biased towards more recent information, you need a leakier integrator. And this type of network could um, be tunable to produce, to fastly transition between uh, leaky and stable integrators. Okay. No more questions? Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll have a coffee break from now. Uh -huh.